In this particular section, we're going to focus on using Team Foundation's version control system. So what are you going to learn in this particular video? We're going to go over a couple of the things you would work with when you're actually using TFVC. So the first thing we're going to start with is the Source Explorer. Now you might have seen this already in a couple of previous videos that I've done in this course from where we looked at the Source Explorer, but we're going to dive deeper into it and get you to understand all the pieces of the Source Explorer and a lot of the commands when you're working in the Source Explorer. Then we're going to move to getting the code in. So now we understand the system. We want to start getting our code in there. How do we do that? And then once we have our code in there, you know, how do we manage the changes that are going to occur as I'm doing the work with my code, otherwise known as pending changes in the TFS world? And then we're going to show how you link work to your code check-ins. So again, that's you're using Microsoft's TFS work item tracking system, for example, you can link your check-in to particular work items that you were working on. And we'll show you how that all happens. And lastly, we're going to talk about locking files. So you're going to understand what, what type of locks we have. There's a few different types of locks. We want to make sure that you understand the locks because we can use them for security reasons uh, going forward. So with that, I'd like you to just sit back and enjoy this course and this section. And we're going to jump into the video on Source Control Explorer. In this particular video, we're going to talk about the Source Control Explorer available in Visual Studio. So what will you learn? We're going to explain how you can go about navigating the source code using the Source Control Explorer. And we're going to talk about some of the commands that you can run from the Source Control Explorer against your code. So navigating the code structure is fairly straightforward in the Source Control Explorer. Source Control Explorer is just a tabbed window, much like the Solution Explorer or Team Explorer that's in Visual Studio. And the Source Control Explorer outlines on the left side all the source code folders that I have. And then in the center, it actually will list out whatever's in that directory that I'm clicked on. So in this case, you can see from the image here, I've clicked on the controllers directory in the left side, and it shows me what code files are available. Not only that, if you look at the top, it has a local path. Again, we talked about workspaces earlier. This is a mapping to my local workspace. And then we have, you can see here, it's checked out currently in an edit mode by this user. And when was it last checked in? So you get a lot of information about that. The other thing you have is the source location right above the local path there. And that's actually the path to the files in version control. So in case you're going to need those for anything, you have that, you have your local path. And you can navigate throughout the application this way in version control. So what are you going to be able to do in the Source Control Explorer? Well, the basic functions, check in, check out a code, delete, rollback. So those are some basic things you can do. But you can also go in and do things like branch, merge, label, shelve. We talked about shelving already. Uh, again, you can do pending changes or undo pending changes. You can get the latest version. You can actually open it up in File Explorer. So you can actually go into your Source Control Explorer, right click on a directory or a file and select to open in File Explorer and it'll kick off Windows Explorer on your machine if you're on Windows and will actually let you see what's in that directory. It'll take you right into the source control in, in your working directory. So again, like I stated earlier, you can do branching and merging down there. And some of the advanced features, which we're going to talk about later, are things like uh, labeling, locking. We're going to talk about locking in this particular section. And you can do things like compare. So again, if you want to compare files between each other, we talked a little bit about this before, uh, you'll be able to compare the files that you have you know, in source control. And you can compare source control against a source controlled file, or you can compare a source controlled file versus a local working copy of the file. So again, there's a couple different ways you can go about actually doing the compare. And all these commands are available to you from the source control explorer. So with that, what I want to do now is I want to go into the Source Control Explorer in my Visual Studio environment. I want to show you how we're going to go about doing some of these things in Source Control Explorer. 
Okay, so I'm here in the Visual Studio environment and we have opened the Source Control Explorer. If it's not open on your machine when you go in, you can very easily go to the Team Explorer as you see here on the right side and click on the Source Control Explorer option and that will launch the Source Control Explorer for your project. This is only working with Team Foundation version controls. I know that TFS has two different version control systems. It also has Git. This Source Control Explorer is only available for TFVC. And since this course is all on TFVC, we'll focus on that. You'll notice here on the left side, we have the folders like I showed you earlier. And this is connected to a TFS server. And then it lists out the current projects that are available to me that are in source control that are of type Team Foundation version control. They're not the Git ones. And you'll notice here in the center screen, we have the build process templates and some other ones, Tailspin Toys and Windows Forms Application 1. So again, we can add files into TFS. It will, in projects into TFS, it'll show up in there. Uh, so one of the things you'll notice right away here is that some of these might be a little grayed out. I don't know if you can tell here, but like packed CMMI, stakeholder training, and Tailspin Toys are all simple, sort of grayed out compared to iOS. And one of the things that you'll notice when you see that is that that means it's not mapped. It's a visual indicator that shows that you're currently not mapped from your workspace, from version control to your local working copy. And we talked about this before in setting up a workspace. All you have to do is either click on the not mapped right click and bring you know do a get latest or whatever and it'll prompt you for for you to get that set up well, i'm going to focus on the ios app okay and you'll notice here we have the local path up up here right above the center window and you can see the location and source control is the ios location it's at the root and then in here we have a few different folders that actually hold the code files so we have tests and employee directory. You'll notice this build process templates item above there. The build process templates item, the first folder in the list there, gets created by default. And that's where the process templates for running the older versions of builds would go. So Microsoft redid their build engine, their automated build engine uh, in, in code um, 2015, the TFS 2015. And they left in the backwards compatibility with what they call the XAML builds or any kind of build that was done when using the Windows Workflow Designer. And those XAML build templates are available in that directory. And so all projects will usually have that directory in there. And that's what that's for. So you can delete it if you're never going to use it. But I just leave it there because you never know if I'm going to go back and ever use it for anything. Uh, we want to make sure we have it available. Uh, so we'll go into the employees directory and double click on that and you can see it lists out all our different files. So there's a couple different things I want to show you here. On the folder side, we're going to click on the employee directory. I'm going to right click on it and you can see here I can do things like get the latest, open in file explorer. So let's say I want to open it in file explorer. It'll actually go out and open up my local working copy of it on my local machine. So with that, let's go and look at a checkout for edit. We can check out a directory for edit or a particular file or group of files. We can do a get latest and that will tell us that everything's currently up to date at this time. We can actually go here and do a rollback or a move. So sometimes we may set up our source control and realize, you know, I need to move these folders around a little bit and move these code files to different areas. And what you can do is move them with that move command. And all the move is, is really a rename at the end of the day. It's, it's path-based renaming. So we just understand that. Again, rollback is pretty straightforward. We're going to roll back to a previous version. You can see here we can roll back by change set. I can roll back by a range of change sets or a specific version. And again, the version, the specific version can be a date, a label, a workspace version, or a change set. Most of the time you're rolling back to a change set because that's that group of files that was checked in. So for example, I may go and select change set and go over here and it's actually going to list out any change sets in my directory. So again, it only sees the one because we just did the initial load into version control and that's it. 
again, it would list out all the files in this or all the change sets in this particular window here, and I could select the one I want to roll back to. Let's cancel those. We actually have the ability to check in any pending changes or shelve changes, like we've already talked about in this in this series. We talked about shelving and how you go about doing that. And next thing is the history. We want to view history on a particular directory or a particular project. We can do that here. And the a couple of things you can do inside this window are you can actually go and track chain sets. So it's not going to let me because I don't have any other chain sets or any branches in my code at this point. So we'll close that. But what that allows us to do you now as we go on through the course and go into branching and merging and stuff, we'll be showing those features. It allows me to track that chain set as it moved through the system from maybe from the develop branch into a release branch and finally out into the wild. We can track all that using this uh, track changes item or track change set and we can watch it. There's our change set one. So maybe our change set was a, a bug fix or it was a new feature. We can track where that feature went or where that bug fix is at in the system at this time. So when folks ask, you know, when is it going to get released? Do you have an, a, an idea of, okay, it's, it's currently in QA or it's currently in UAT. So those are, those are some of the things you can look at there from the history window. You also have the ability to add folders or add items to a folder. So if you feel like there's some items that are left out and you want to add them in the TFS, you can do that. Obviously, branching and merging is going to be a big deal, and we're going to focus on branching and merging in another section here in the course. Uh, but we'll see you can do a couple of things there. You can branch, you can merge, and you can convert a folder to a branch. And we'll talk all about that when we get into the branching and merging. You can do a find. You can find by label, find by change set, or find by shelf set. What you're not seeing there is you cannot find by wildcard. So with that, you're going to have to go out and probably install an extension from the marketplace. And we've talked about the marketplace already. And in the marketplace, there's most likely an extension for allowing you to do a wildcard searches of your source code. And then lastly, we have advanced. You can do things like get a specific version. So maybe I want to get a specific change set or a specific labels code. Then I can actually tell it to overwrite any writable files that are not checked out and overwrite all the files, even if they match. And what I'm doing by doing those two checkboxes, checking them, is I'm basically taking what's currently selected in the top there, that employee's directory, and I'm pulling that down to my local machine and its workspace and, and basically overwriting everything that's there. I don't want it to merge it. I don't want to, you know, anything. I want it gone, and I want to lay this on top of it. And that's how I go about doing that. That's a forced get, basically. And some of the other things here was locking. We're going to talk about the locking later on in the course, so you're going to see about what type of locks we can have. You can apply a label. So at some point in time, you may want to label the code files or the group of files uh, that are going to go out into the release pipeline or maybe in the QA. Uh, again, all those can be labeled. Also, to understand that if you are using the TFS automated build engine, every time you run a build, it can create a label for you on the items that it built. So any code that was involved in that particular build, you can actually tell it to label that group of code for you. Security. I don't see many people working in this particular security window. This really gets you granular on your security in TFS. So let this pop open here. And what it allows us to do is really look at our particular source control and decide who has what rights. So you'll notice here I have a, let's go to the contributors. This is your everyday dev, you know, developer person who's working on the code. And you can see here, you can do things like check in. Uh, you can check in others' changes, not set. So let me tell you a little bit about security, and we're going, to, we're going to talk probably a little more about this as we go through the course here and there. When you see something that's not set, I usually turn it to deny. It's implied deny if it's not set. I want to ex explicitly imply that it's not set by saying it's denied. I want to be very explicit about that. 
I don't want anybody other than me churning in my code, okay? Label, lock, manage the branches, again, not set. We don't want just all the developers being able to manage branches. Not saying they're not capable of managing the branches, but we don't want everybody to be able to go in and just start working with the branches. We usually have an SCM person or somebody that monitors the bills and the, uh, the branches and the merging that's going on in the application. Again, we have some merges here, and I, I'm going to deny the merge. And so you can't branch and you can't merge. Pending change in the server workspaces allow. We can read, obviously. And then the last few are not set, like unlock other users' changes. You know, we're not going to allow that. We're not going to undo anybody's changes. And we're not going to revise anybody's changes. So we'll set those there. And then what I do is save my changes. Now you can get all the way down into the folder level. So this is, I had a folder level. This is for the employee directory for contributors that are trying to access the employee directory. Again, we can go all the way up to the iOS level or we can go all the way down to the file level. You know, it all depends. Again, I don't see a lot of folks working in permissions like that. It, it's just really difficult to maintain. But if you do happen to see a scenario in your organization where you have to do that, uh, then at that time you, you have the ability there and that's that's how you do it. Lastly, we have properties for version control and cloaking. So we can cloak a folder and we talked about cloaking earlier when we talked about workspaces. When you pull your code down, you can actually tell it to cloak this particular directory or that particular directory or file so we don't bring it down to our local workspace. But you can actually set it at the source control level so that when anybody pulls down that code, it doesn't pull down that directory. Because cloaking in the workspace is just for your workspace. So if I cloak files in my workspace, you know, my teammates may not be cloaking that file and they're bringing that all down to their machine. Whereas in this case, we're cloaking the files or the folders and no one's going to be able to bring them down to their machine when they do their checkouts. So again, there's a couple different uh, ways you can do the cloaking piece. So with that, let's go over into the middle here and you'll notice that it's the exact same items. Some of them are grayed out because we don't have any pending changes and we don't have any shelving of pending changes going on. So with that, I'd like to just go back and, and wrap up. Uh, this is really a nice walkthrough of the Source Control Explorer, you're going to use this a lot when you're using TFEC, so get comfortable with it, and I hope this helps you to get started on that road. And with that, like I say, let's go back and wrap up. Okay, so what did you learn in this particular video? Well, we showed you how you can navigate the source code, and we showed you a lot of the different commands that are available in the Source Control Explorer.